Hello everyone, I am Mohammed Hamama, and this is your ASCP preparation camp. In this camp, we will go through each topic on the ASCP lecture list. In today's video, we will be discussing examination of the peripheral blood film in correlation with the complete blood count. Peripheral blood films are typically collected from lavender top tubes containing EDTA as an anticoagulant. Blood films made from EDTA tubes can produce high quality results if made within 2 to 3 hours of collection. However, blood in EDTA tubes that remains at room temperature for more than 5 hours may have unacceptable blood cell artifacts. In certain cases, a different anticoagulant or no anticoagulant may be needed to prevent platelet satellitosis and pseudoleukocytosis. Finger and heel punctures can also be a source of blood for films. But there may be limitations and problems associated with this method as some platelet clumping can be expected if films are made directly from a drop of finger stick or heel stick blood or if blood is collected in heparinized microhematocrit tubes. Additionally, only a few films can be made directly from blood from a skin puncture before the site stops bleeding. However, if slides are made quickly and correctly, cell distribution and morphology should be adequate. EDTA microcollection tubes can be used to eliminate these issues. Peripheral film preparation A crucial aspect of hematology There are several types of films, and the manual wedge technique is the most commonly used and convenient method. To make a wedge film, at least two clean glass slides are required with one serving as the film slide and the other as the pusher slide. A drop of blood is placed at one end of the slide, and the pusher slide is held securely at a 30 to 45 degree angle and drawn back into the drop of blood, allowing the blood to spread across the slide's width. The slide is then quickly and smoothly pushed forward to create a wedge film. It is essential to pick up and spread the whole drop of blood, maintain an even, gentle pressure, and keep the same angle all the way to the end of the film. A procedure is called a push-type wedge preparation, where the spreader slide is pulled into the drop of blood, and the film is made by pushing the blood along the slide. The same procedure can be modified to produce a pulled film, where the spreader slide is pushed into the drop of blood and pulled along the length of the slide to make the film. There are other variations on the wedge technique, including using the 3-inch side of the slide as the spreader slide or balancing the spreader slide on the fingers to avoid placing too much pressure on it. Learning to make consistently good blood films requires practice, patience, and persistence. It is crucial to choose the best film for staining, dispose of the others properly, and save one unstained film in case another slide is required. The size of the drop of blood is important, and too large or too small a drop can affect the film's quality. When the hematocrit is higher than normal or lower than usual, the angle of the slide may need to be adjusted to achieve the desired film thickness. High quality, beveled edge microscopic slides with chamfered corners are recommended for good lateral borders. The diff safe dispenser may be used to deliver the drop of blood without removing the stopper from the EDTA tube. Here are the features of a well-made wedge peripheral blood film. 1. The film should be 2 thirds to 3 fourths the length of the slide. 2. The film should be finger-shaped with a very slight roundness at the feather edge, rather than bullet-shaped, to provide the widest area for examination. 3. The lateral edges of the film should be visible. 4. The film should be smooth, without any irregularities, holes, or streaks. 5. When held up to the light, the thin portion, feather edge, of the film should have a rainbow appearance. 6. The whole drop of blood should be picked up and spread. To prevent drying artifacts, blood films, and bone marrow smears should be dried promptly before staining, regardless of the preparation method. Some labs use a fan to speed up the process but blowing breath on a slide is not recommended since the moisture in breath can cause RBCs to develop echinocytic or water artifacts. The next step is the staining of peripheral blood films. 
The process of staining peripheral blood films and bone marrow smears is accomplished using a polychrome stain, which is either a pure right stain or a right gimsa stain also named Romanowski stain, that contains both eosin and methylene blue. The main objective of staining blood films is to make the cells more visible and enable their morphology to be evaluated. For consistent day-to-day -day staining quality, it is essential to maintain proper staining conditions. To fix the cells to the slide, methanol is used in the stain, while the actual staining of cells or cellular components occurs only when the buffer is added. The staining reactions are pH-dependent, so the buffer added to the stain should be either 0.05 M sodium phosphate, pH 6.4, or aged distilled water, distilled water placed in a glass bottle for at least 24 hours, pH 6.4 to 6.8. When the oxidized methylene blue and eosin combine, they form a thiazineosinate complex that stains neutral components. Free methylene blue is basic and stains acidic and basophilic cellular components, such as RNA. On the other hand, free eosin is acidic and stains basic and eosinophilic components, such as hemoglobin and eosinophilic granules. Neutrophils are named so because they have cytoplasmic granules that have a neutral pH and pick up some staining characteristics from both stains. Before staining, it is crucial to ensure that the slides are completely dry, otherwise, the thick part of the blood film may come off during the staining process. Drying artifacts, a long-standing issue in hematology laboratories, can manifest in different forms, such as giving a moth-eaten look to the RBCs or appearing as a heavily demarcated central pallor, shiny blotches on the RBCs, or echinocytes, crenation, in the areas of the slide that dried most slowly. Several factors contribute to drying artifacts, such as humidity in the air during slide drying or water absorbed from the air into the alcohol-based stain. Extremely anemic patients pose a challenge to avoid drying artifacts because of the high ratio of plasma to RBCs. To mitigate this issue, some laboratories fix slides in pure, anhydrous methanol before staining, while others use a stain containing 10% volume-to-volume methanol to minimize water or drying artifacts. Properly maintaining the staining conditions is crucial to ensure consistent results in staining peripheral blood films. Features of a well-stained peripheral blood film Proper staining is important for a good peripheral blood film. Macroscopically, a well-stained blood film should be pink to purple. Microscopically, the RBCs should appear orange to salmon pink, and WBC nuclei should be purple to blue. The cytoplasm of neutrophils should be pink to tan with violet or lilac granules, and eosinophils should have bright orange refractal granules. Faulty staining can cause problems ranging from minor color shifts to the inability to identify cells and assess morphology. Newly stained films are preferable for interpretation, and hints for troubleshooting poorly stained films are provided. Fresh slides produce the best staining results because the blood itself acts as a buffer in the staining process. Slides stained after one week or longer turn out too blue, and specimens with increased levels of proteins, i.e., globulins, produce bluer staining blood films, even when freshly stained. In summary, a well-stained peripheral blood film should have specific colors for RBCs, WBC nuclei, and cytoplasmic granules, and eosinophils. Faulty staining can cause issues in film interpretation, so it is important to troubleshoot poorly stained films. Additionally, fresh slides produce the best staining results, and specimens with high protein levels can affect the staining outcome. Evaluation of a blood film Adjust the microscope with proper lighting and use of 10x or low-power objective lens. Assess overall film quality, color, and distribution of cells. Check feather edge and lateral edges for WBC distribution. Scan film quickly for large abnormal cells, fibrin strands, and RBC distribution. Evaluate area available for suitable examination.
using a 40x high dry or 50x oil immersion objective lens for differential count and cellular morphology. Perform WBC estimate by counting WBCs in 10 fields and finding average WBCs per field. Multiply average WBCs per high power field by 2000 if using a 40x objective or 3000 if using a 50x oil immersion objective to get WBC count per milliliters of blood. Checking for discrepancies between WBC estimate and instrument count can help identify issues. Use 100x oil immersion objective lens for WBC differential count, RBC, WBC, and platelet morphology evaluations, and platelet estimates. Differentiate segmented neutrophils from bands and observe RBC or WBC inclusions. Identify and count abnormal or reactive cells. Report number of nucleated RBCs per 100 WBCs if present. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel, activate notifications to get our new videos, if you like our content please press the like button, and share the video with your friends. If you have any questions leave a comment below. The complete blood count or CBC, is a routine test that assesses white blood cells WBCs, red blood cells RBCs, and platelets. The CBC provides valuable information about a patient's health status and is frequently ordered by healthcare providers. CBC interpretation has two phases, summarizing the numbers and recognizing patterns of results consistent with various diseases. Phase 1 involves collecting pertinent information and summarizing it using appropriate terminology for easy communication. Phase 2 involves narrowing down the diagnosis and recommending appropriate follow-up testing or treatment. White blood cell parameters, step 1, to begin, ensure that the WBC count is accurate by comparing the WBC histogram and or scatterplot to the respective cell counts to confirm that they correlate with one another. Step 2, look at the total WBC count to determine whether it is elevated, leukocytosis, or low, leukopenia. Changes in WBC counts are often associated with infections and conditions like leukemias, and increases or decreases in the total count are typically due to changes in one of the subtypes, such as neutrophils or lymphocytes. Step 3. Examine the relative differential counts to obtain a preliminary assessment of which cell lines are affected. The relative differential count is reported in percentages, and each cell type's proportion can be compared to its reference interval. Appropriate terminology, such as relative neutrophilia for an increase in neutrophils or relative lymphopenia for a decrease in lymphocytes, should be used to describe increases and decreases in each cell type. If the total WBC count or any of the relative values are outside the reference interval, further analysis of the WBC differential is required. If the proportion of one cell type increases, then the proportion of others must decrease, as the proportions are relative to one another. Absolute differential counts are needed to accurately assess whether the second cell type has changed in actual number at all. Step 4 to calculate absolute counts when not reported by the instrument, multiply each relative cell count by the total WBC count to determine the absolute count for each cell lineage. This information helps determine the cause of a leukocytosis, such as an increase in absolute neutrophil count, ANC, or absolute lymphocyte count. Step 5. Examine each cell line for the presence of immature cells, which can indicate infections or malignancies like leukemia. A left shift or shift to the left refers to the presence of increased numbers of bands or cells younger than bands in the peripheral blood. Young lymphocytic or monocytic cells can be reported as prolymphocytes, lymphoblasts, promonocytes, or monoblasts, while young eosinophils and basophils are typically called immature. Step 6. Any abnormalities in the appearance of WBCs should be reported in the morphology section of the report. These abnormalities include changes in overall cellular appearance, such as cytoplasmic toxic granulation, and nuclear abnormalities like hypersegmentation. To summarize the WBC parameters, start with the accurate total WBC count, 
followed by the relative differential or absolute counts, note the presence of any abnormal young cells, and finally, report any abnormal morphology or inclusions. Red blood cell parameters, begin by examining the hemoglobin or hematocrit to detect anemia or polycythemia. Hemoglobin concentration is a more reliable indicator of anemia than hematocrit, as hematocrit can be influenced by the size of the RBCs. Next, evaluate the mean cell volume, MCV, to determine the average RBC volume. Ensure that MCV is within the reference interval, and correlate MCV with the RBC histogram and morphology. Then, examine the mean cell hemoglobin concentration, MCHC, to evaluate how well the cells are filled with hemoglobin. If MCHC is below the reference interval, the cells are called hypochromic. If the MCHC is elevated, it may indicate spherocytosis, which retains normal volume but has decreased surface area. If the MCHC is still higher than usual, it is caused by analytical problems. Finally, the RBC distribution width, RDW, is used to identify the presence and degree of anisocytosis. The width of the histogram, the RDW, is reflected statistically as a coefficient of variation, CV, or a standard deviation, SD. The RDW provides information about the presence and degree of anisocytosis, variation in RBC volume. Platelet parameters in a CBC test include platelet count, mean platelet volume, MPV, and platelet morphology. The following steps should be taken to summarize platelet parameters. Step 1. First, the platelet count should be examined to check for any abnormalities such as thrombocytopenia or thrombocytosis. Decreased platelet count can cause unexplained bleeding or bruising, and pancytopenia may indicate the possibility of developing acute leukemia or aplastic anemia, whereas pancytosis is associated with polycythemia vera. Step 2. The MPV generated by the instrument should be compared with the reference interval, 6.9 to 10.2 FL, and the observed platelet diameter on the peripheral blood film. An elevated MPV should correspond with an increase in platelet diameter, just like an elevated MCV reflects macrocytosis. In platelet consumption disorders such as immune thrombocytopenic purpura, an elevated MPV accompanied by giant platelets reflects bone marrow release of early stress or reticulated platelets, indicating bone marrow compensation. The MPV has a wide percent CV, which reflects interindividual variation in platelet swelling in EDTA, reducing its clinical effectiveness. Step 3. Platelet morphology and arrangement should also be examined. Although the MPV can recognize abnormally large platelets, morphological evaluation notes this as well. Large and giant platelets can be distinguished, and platelet size can be compared to RBC size. Morphologic descriptors for reporting granularity, such as hypogranular or the granular, should also be noted. Abnormalities in platelet arrangement, such as clumping or adherence to WBCs, should be reported. Reporting total number, platelet size by either instrument MPV or morphologic evaluation, and platelet appearance is essential in summarizing platelet parameters. When the CBC results are appropriately summarized, the Phase II interpretation of the results will be reliable. Adopting a systematic approach to examining each parameter ensures that the vast amount of information available from the CBC can be used effectively and efficiently in patient care. Thank you for completing the video, remember to ask for ASCP short notes, and don't forget to subscribe, bye.